Anyway, uh, so I'd like to start with uh, a little bit of uh, conceptual, uh, I don't know, crankiness. And that is uh, something that has to do with uh, the way we use this term in Germany, <coughs> based on uh, the work of uh, our great Emmanuel Wallerstein, who has passed away a few months ago. Uh, in his work, uh, he basically introduces the term um, uh, and gives a number of uh, uh, different uh, meanings to it. The most, so the simplest, most straightforward of those is that uh, Germany is, uh, uh, is something that a particular state has at any point in uh, the history of the capitalist world system. There's only one hegemon, um, and that, and it, what it refers to is the supremacy of the most powerful state, meaning it is a power relationship between one state and the rest of the world system, and that includes all the other core states. So the hegemony is actually, to its, in, in terms of its, uh, how should I say, the um, intellectual um, core of it, um, at least in the mind of uh, Wallace and, and uh, a large number of Wallace um, is uh, the reverse of the relationship between a particular state and the rest of the core, first and foremost. And then, uh, second of all, that particular state and uh, the whole of the capitalist world system. Now, if we, and, and the way it is used is uh, um, uh, that, you know, that, that basically has implication, two implications which uh, merit a certain kind of uh, special attention. One is the term hegemon, which is that particular state which has that hegemony, right? Um, and the other is a hegemonic transition. Uh, hegemonic transition uh, refers to the large-scale process of social change whereby one particular hegemon gives way to another hegemon. There, was, there will always there be, or there has always at least been a hegemon, uh, I should say, according to the Wallacean theory, um, uh, during the history of the capitalist world system, that is since the long 16th century on. Uh, and, but there has always been only one. And uh, there was a, actually a sort of a linear succession of states, and I'll get to that in a moment. At this point, I want to sort of introduce three little uh, uh, um, comments about this. One uh, is that Wallerstein, I, I, I hate to say this, but that took in a somewhat disappointing way, to me at least, emphasizes, uh, when he talks about the hegemon, he emphasizes the hegemon's ability to shape the international system in such a way that value flows to it. Now, it was, of course, true, but that, um, uh, it, I think, is way understanding the concept because there's a lot more to the hegemon, at least as uh, those of us that uh, pay attention uh, to the world today, um, uh, 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 that you might want to consider as a sort of analytical addition to that concept, for instance, not only uh, be able to uh, channel flows to itself, I mean, value, you know, uh, unequal exchange and the value flow flowing from the peripheries to the core and within the core to the hegemon. Yeah, but in order to do that, there has to be uh, a world order. And that world order has to be maintained. And uh, that's not a small task. Uh, and uh, it's not like that Wallace doesn't uh, acknowledge that, but uh, there are points where he doesn't, and that kind of concerns me. And now the second question that I kind of have in my mind, uh, having read Wallace uh, in the prehistoric times, and also <coughs> In the garden. Um, uh, I have been thinking about that, um, uh, how that applies, this whole idea um, applies to our world today. And one question that emerges in my mind does the hegemon actually have to be a state? Now, uh, of course, it has always been a state throughout the uh, history of capitalism, but that, that does that mean that it's necessarily a state? And the reason I'm raising this possibility is that there are all manner of quasi states or state like arrangement, supra-state uh, organizational, uh, how should I say, uh, initiatives worldwide that seem to, uh, that could, whose behavior could be construed as a possible uh, sort of uh, bid towards becoming uh, a hegemon. For instance, we just mentioned something, oh, I don't know, NATO, mm -hmm. uh, which happens to be a, a, a military intelligence uh, and the overall uh, uh, law and order organization uh, whose purpose is to keep the world at bay, 
uh, with uh, resources uh, to the tune of oh, 50% of the world GDP at its hand, something like that. I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying that I'm raising the possibility. What if it's not a state? What we allow quasi states to be hegemonic? That, of course, is, uh, as we'll see in about five minutes, uh, that I'm, I'm raising this problem in a very sort of intentional, studied way because once we get to the European Union, uh, this question will actually emerge right there. Um, if it's not a state, to just continue with this wild idea, then what would be the mechanisms that uh, will ensure that the world is at bay? Uh, in other words, what would be the equivalent mechanisms of a non-state hegemon uh, to keep uh, discipline at, uh, uh, all over the world that is today the US, United States military? And I don't really have, the, have an answer, but it's a really interesting question, at least in my mind. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, Wallerstein's work and uh, some of his colleagues, uh, Giovanni Arighi should be mentioned, but uh, also their students, uh, have articulated the idea of hegemonic trans transition uh, quite a bit. Wallerstein seems, Wallerstein seems to have been settled on the idea that there have been four hegemons, and uh, the fourth one is the US. But we really never really got a specific historical sociology of what it is that a hegemon needs to have in order to be a hegemon and what it is that the non-hegemons don't have. And what is it, therefore, that the outgoing, declining hegemon needs to lose in order to lose it? And what is it that the, an up-and-coming would-be hegemon needs to acquire in order to get it? These are not small questions because, uh, 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 and this is the four uh, that uh, was in uh, and RDB and others articulate, these were the four uh, hegemons um, uh, had been. The reason I'm bringing this up uh, is that, and then in this sharp turn, I'd like to sort of turn the conversation on to the current genre. <coughs> um, what is the I, I guess the $64,000 question uh, before us all intellectuals who are to be viewing the world as it is uh, sort of uh, uh, transforming uh, in front of our eyes is what is it that we are seeing? What is it that we're part of? Uh, and here's a couple of, uh, uh, <coughs> a set of uh, possible suggestions. Uh, just a congregative shift, sort of a bumpy kind of turn in, uh, in the logic of uh, uh, global capitalism. Congregative, of course, refers to the 50 to 70 year cycles of the world economy discovered by that Russian economist and then very successfully adopted by Wallace and his students later on. Is that what it is? I actually don't think so. Um, for one thing, uh, uh, I, the cognitive composition has seemed to die down, at least in my readings recently, particularly because nobody can fit this 50 to 70 year cycle on the world anymore. <laughs> the last couple of decades seem to be off a little bit from that. Um, but anyway, yeah, I could be wrong about that, but this is just kind of a comment. Um, um, or is it an unsuccessful hegemonic takeover attempt that will be beaten back by the current hegemon? Uh, is it a hegemonic transition? If it's a hegemonic transition, then well, we have a more, more or less an idea uh, of who the, the current hegemon might be, but that, that who is it that's coming up? I'd like to know. Um, um, or is it, and here, here comes the science fiction part of my uh, presentation, what if we have a new logic of uh, hegemony? What if we are viewing, for so witnessing something like the rise of a global two or three or more n plus one way uh, global condominium? Condominium is a technical term, basically means co-ruling, right? Ruling together. Uh, it's not impossible. We have seen uh, imperial arrangements of that sort. Uh, is that what it is uh, globally? Um, uh, if that's what it is, and who will be the participants? Um, um, or are we seeing a change in the logic of the system? In other words, are we seeing a, a continuation of capitalism, but a different kind of capitalism? We cannot a priori exclude that possibility. Um, I really don't know uh, how to address it, but at least I'd like to keep it in my mind as a possibility that we might see uh, the emergence of a differently economic 
kind of capitalism, or is it even possible to have a capitalism without a hegemon? By the way, so football, I don't think so. But that's that basically just not possible. Geopolitics teaches me that's not possible. And finally, um, as it has been raised uh, for uh, 15 years by now, at least in the world system circles, where I'm moving, maybe uh, we are actually seeing the end of work capitalism. And if that's what it is, what, it, what is coming? And this is not, uh, I know this sounds awfully, uh, how should I say, uh, daring and funny at the same time, and particularly in uh, Budapest at this particular point in time. But uh, the fact that we don't see it uh, realistically, we don't feel it, <laughs> that uh, may not mean that it's not true. There's a lot of things we didn't feel in the last couple of decades. So this is just a comment to my fellow Hungarians. <laughs> anyway, so these are the questions, and uh, the, these are the things that we should be talking about in a certain way when we talk about the global geopolitical economy. Now, uh, coming back to the critique of uh, the concept. Uh, actually, I think that uh, Wallace he took that word, hegemony, uh, well, I'm sure he was aware of uh, Gramsci's use of the word, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure he took it from, let's just say, low concept, uh, international relations, uh, writing, where the idea was that hegemony just means the most powerful state. However, I just wanted to sort of remind us all that there was a uh, 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 different uh, meaning of the term, and that was way before Wallace and that is, of course, something that is coming out of the work of Daniel uh, Gramsci. Uh, and I'm using a quote here that, uh, that is a reconstruction that is the result of the work by the Subaltern Studies Group uh, in India. Uh, these are intellectuals who have been working together for several decades, and uh, uh, this particular formulation came out very late in 1998, but uh, the, the origin of the, of the ideas is a good 20, 25 years earlier. Um, uh, so, Ranjit uh, Guha points it out in the in introduction to his uh, 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 book Dominance Without Hegemony, which is basically centered on this very issue. Uh, Dominance Without Hegemony is, of course, the definition of what colonial rule is. And the idea is that uh, the metropolitan state was hegemonic in character, with its claim to dominance based on a power relation in which the moment of persuasion outweigh that of coercion. Whereas the colonial state was non-hegemonic with persuasion uh, outweighed by coercion in its structure of dominance. In other words, what he is uh, pointing out is that the same West European states were hegemonic, meaning uh, in their domestic power relations, persuasion outweighed coercion. Whereas in their relationship, uh, to the subject populations in the colonies, coercion outweighed uh, persuasion. He's not saying that there is only coercion, he's not saying there is only persuasion. He's saying both exist, there is a certain kind of balance between them, and the formula uh, is that uh, there is hegemony, meaning uh, persuasion outweighing coercion in the uh, colonial state inside. The, 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 sort of the European context, and there is non-hegemony, meaning colonial oppression, in the colony. Um, this, by the way, I should also point out that uh, uh, very powerful Marxist uh, critic of this particular theory by the name of Chibber has uh, worked on Griffiths to refute this idea, uh, and in this regard, I kind of tend to agree. Chibber, um, uh, namely that uh, Chibber is uh, arguing very powerfully that uh, that uh, persuasion based uh, hegemony in the uh, in the colonial state in Europe that's a myth. There was a tremendous amount of uh, coercion and oppression there also. That's, that's basically the idea. Anyway, um, so applying this uh, concept, uh, uh, this sense of the word hegemony to the global uh, uh, geopolitical economy, global uh, hegemony would be a situation where the maintenance of the system proceeds without the predominance of coercion. The reason I'm putting it this way would be uh, because it is, of course, we all know, pretty uh, uh, much absurd. Uh, capitalism cannot be maintained. 
and particularly not on a global level. Uh, and not even uh, true, and uh, in, in, in the domestic situations, uh, in the European colonial states. So, uh, as a result, even though I give the title uh, Hegemony Turbulence to this paper, my conclusion from all this is that I'm proposing that we abandon this word and uh, not talk about hegemony anymore. Uh, what we are talking about is dominance. Uh, when I try to make it into a concept, it dissolves. That's my point. Okay. So, um, now, uh, the rest of, it, of my presentation is basically a consideration of a couple of empirical facts. Now, this of course puts me in uh, a very disadvantaged situation because uh, the, the topic of coercion, particularly uh, globally, uh, is very much part of geopolitics and at the same time uh, has a tendency of being completely secret. Uh, uh, not, nor is it particularly palatable to my taste to study uh, particular ways in which large populations of humans can be tortured and killed. It's, that's just not how I am somehow. And uh, so, as a result, uh, I'm sort of uh, at a disadvantage, uh, but, but I did find uh, secret data, the South Tom Institute for Peace Research. Um, uh, this is the distribu global distribution of uh, 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 military expenditures in the world, according to the latest scale uh, figure. So, the large chunk there is, of course, the United States. Uh, that's <coughs> one of the 200 or so states in the world. Um, uh, so if we were to expect uh, the whole hypothesis was that it was equal, <laughs> then it would be, uh, well, I don't know, uh, half a percent. Uh, <laughs> it would be the share if we do it on the basis of population, share, that's what it is now, 320, maybe 5 percent. And if we do it on the basis of uh, sharing the world economy, it would be 18 to 20 percent, well, instead of over that, it is 36 percent. I was actually expecting a, a greater share, probably it is in reality. Um, one should you know, take these uh, uh, numbers with a grain of salt. Um, the, um, the second largest, of course, is China, which is, of course, 20% uh, of the world's population and it only spends 14% um, um, of um, uh, its, its expenditures, only 40%. Um, this also puts uh, not a whole lot of Americans in the room, I don't think, but uh, those of us that follow the U.S. Uh, rhetoric of Russia, just you know, look at the number for Russia, I can't know, 3.4%, that's the big enemy of the United States. Um, uh, Present Zeta for the, are the 40 greatest spenders in the world, military spenders, um, and uh, from that, that's a large part of the military spending in the world, and from that it's possible to calculate something called the Hirschman index, which is a, a measure of, uh, of the um, competitiveness or non-competitiveness of a particular market. Um, one of the inventors of it is, of course, Alberto Hirschman. I have no idea who Herfindahl was, but anyway, never mind. The point is that it's a really easy computation, and the Her hirschman herfindahl index for the 40 top spenders in the world is 15. 86, and uh, the conventional uh, uh, approach is that below 1500, uh, a market is considered to be reasonably competitive. So this is just above that. It's a, it would be a moderately um, uh, concentrated market. Again, I was actually expecting a lot greater number. Uh, so I'm starting to have a feeling that maybe we are actually overestimating the strength of the United States uh, in, global, in, uh, in global military terms. Uh, and that, of course, you know, I should I don't really have time, but uh, should, I can't resist. I have to point it out that, of course, the military spending is one of the hundreds of irrelevant measures of uh, power in, in this military power, including, for instance, uh, <coughs> spread of the troops worldwide military bases, logistical uh, issues, supply routes, and all kinds of other things. And of course, in those regards, the United States is doing a lot better than 36%. <clears throat> so the United States has vastly more uh, military bases abroad than all the other countries, 199 countries of the world combined. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and so on. But is that a sign of strength? That is a really interesting intellectual problem for me about the world today. Is that a sign of strength? Or is that a sign of something else? And that is a really, uh, I really don't know how to uh, answer it, but, but uh, <coughs> just, uh, uh, that just kind of comes up. And here comes then the, 
big question, which is, uh, I'm just going to run through the rest of my slides and then I'll uh, uh, give the floor to the next speakers. Um, uh, how does all this relate uh, to uh, economic power, or relative economic weight in the world? This is really important because uh, in order to be able, uh, able to police the world, you have to have uh, resources. And uh, um, access to a powerful economy is a really important resource. Without that, you can't maintain military strength for long. Uh, now, this is the United States uh, in the world, according to uh, its share in the world economy over the last, uh, well, I don't know, uh, 60 something years. Clear decline went from uh, 38 to 18 uh, percent or so. It did stop at uh, 2008, but the decline continued. I just don't have the more recent data. And here comes the, the second part of my, uh, the topic of the second part of my presentation, and that's the European Union. The European Union is a very peculiar animal. I actually wrote a whole book about it, which, uh, rest assured, I'm not going to uh, review for you here. But the basic idea of the EU is that its, uh, it is that, uh, that its constituent states, the most powerful member states of the EU, have come together and formed this quasi-state, state-like but not state union, <clears throat> because they realize that they are unable to compete in terms of size in the world economy alone. So um, that was clear already at the end of World War II, when the United States uh, uh, basically uh, handed sort of uh, European peace to them, and uh, it continued to be true. Uh, so the European Union was uh, essentially uh, 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 an agreement at first by six and then <coughs> other West European states, whose main logic was that we have to come together and we have to bury our hatchets, we have to uh, be able to talk with each other because we need to be together in order to have enough weight in the world to influence the world events. We cannot have uh, Western Europe where various West European states would work against each other in the global arena. Uh, if you look at the, the graph for the EU, which is basically the European Union at the time, so uh, there would be these that's, 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 that's jump. That jump, those jumps, those are the enlargements. In other words, the European Union was a size-making or a weight-making device that had a very peculiar technique of making economic, <coughs> gaining economic weight. And that is by swallowing states. Particularly, at first, you know, in various complicated ways. Even Britain wasn't part of it, not that it is now, but never mind. Um, and then, then, since 1989, it became very clear that it's going to proceed this way. So the Eastern enlargement is not, did not happen because they like us. It didn't happen because they don't like us. It happened because of a certain kind of logic, which is that uh, there needs to be more uh, uh, shared weight in order to maintain the uh, global power of a European capital. Uh, now, this, that project has, and that is the, here comes the second part of the title of my uh, paper here, or presentation, uh, the end of the global project of the EU. The global project of the EU was making weight, and that has come to an end. And that has come to an end for three reasons. First, it ran out of states that it could include. Of course, it, in theory, it could include Ukraine and Russia, and who knows what, but it's just not going to happen. It's not, it's not possible. It's not realistic. They are telling the Ukrainians that it will happen, but that doesn't mean that it's true. They have been telling Turkey that it's going to happen, and Turkey has an, a, a, a pending application to the EU for, what, 30-something years now? So that's not going to happen. And uh, the second problem is that with Brexit, we have now actually the departure of one of the largest and most powerful economic and most powerful members of the EU, and there might be others. And the third, a um, uh, factor that is uh, uh, putting an end to the global project of the EU is what is referred to as the rise of China. That's of course, that of course is already a West-centric or Euro-centric ex expression because, of course, it is rise from the, after the crisis that the West has subjected China to. Right? In 1820, China constituted 36 percent of the world economy. Can you repeat that: 36 percent in 1820. 
So um, uh, right now it is around, oh, I don't know, 18, 20 percent, uh, more or less where everybody else is. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, since China does have 20% of the world uh, population, that means uh, if it went to 30% of the world economy, that would mean that it would only have 150% uh, of the world average per capita GDP, which is more or less what Hungary has. So from the perspective of Hungary, uh, or Poland, or something like that, Slovenia, who are we to tell China that they cannot live like we do? More importantly, how are we going to stop it if we want to? It's not possible. It's not possible. These are the processes that are greater than individuals or uh, societies in states. So that means, because this is essentially a zero sum game, and your share in the world economy depends on the, the share of others, and the fact that China is growing um, is going to put everybody else on a decline. Sorry, I, let me uh, close by. Uh, 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 saying something about the EU and then leaving it uh, to uh, the discussion. Uh, so the, uh, the EU still has what I call the elasticity of size. The elasticity of size is basically a game that the European Union plays in international fora. I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's a very clever game. In the fora where the rule of voting is such that uh, what matters is how many nation states there are, the EU votes individual member states. So that would be whatever it is, the number of, uh, of the states. Now 28. 28 so. votes right there. For instance, in the UN General Assembly. It's kind of the equivalent to have the United States having 50 votes on account of the fact that it has 50 states. Or in the other side. In uh, other forum, where what matters is how much capital and we do that, for instance, in the World Bank, and, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the other guys who's maybe escaping me right now. I am Thank you. Uh, hey, oh, there you are. Unity. There you are. We're all together. Because that's what gives weight to the vote. Right? So it's a, this is a dynamic shifting uh, in certain conditions. Under certain conditions, it's a bunch of nation states. In other conditions, it's a one loving way. Well, except for what we just said. The point being that this game is still available to the remaining Hindu, but with less and less weight. In other words, that particular modality of the game when they're using their weight is going to be less and less. Right? Just saying. But the really powerful uh, uh, future for the EU rests in two additional dimensions. One is ideological. Ideological. There is a, an incredibly unpleasant uh, ideological dominance in the world, and that is, is something that uh, uh, Papa Chatterjee calls the rule of colonial difference, uh, basically the, uh, the pronouncement of European goodness. Right? The, the moral geopolitical argument that goodness resides in the Western world. Everybody else is bad, we are good. That's not too complicated, but this is basically the essentially the uh, I say the ethical uh, system of colonialism and it really go away. Uh, that's exactly what the official ideology of the European Union is today, right now. And how do we prove it? Well, we can't prove it, we better believe it. Because we can't prove it. But we believe it. We choose to believe it because it works for us. This is basically what the EU has, and it will continue to have. The more the leader it will be, the more it will have that. And uh, it has a number of uh, very unpleasant corollaries. For instance, uh, Eurocentrism, race cognition, meaning the idea that, uh, that uh, supposedly race, quote unquote, difference actually matters. It's hilarious uh, uh, to any thinking person, but that's basically how the world seems to work. Euro whiteness, the idea that it is not only whiteness but a specific kind of whiteness that is good. So that's the European kind of whiteness, not no other kind of whiteness, or it's European. <laughs> and, Euro, and what I call it, the rule of Euro, uh, European difference, which is basically the idea of, uh, that we are more or less kind of similar, really, but not nearly as good as Western world, meaning we in Eastern Europe. <laughs> Um, there is one set of things that are, uh, are, are still available to the EU, and the, the final thing is, of course, is Eastern Europe, 
as a as a as a profit uh, subsidy mechanism, and I really don't have time to show it, but. Uh, this is the uh, globalization rate for the countries of this region, all around the way above the world average. In other words, we're all way more globalized and more open to the world than, than, uh, than the world average. And of course, the world here remains all very predominantly Western Europe. This is all basically uh, our own uh, whole region, the former socialist bloc uh, of Eastern Europe, of Soviet Union, of this part, in between has become a, a profit subsidy uh, a generating device for the European capital and that will continue uh, until of course uh, some of the uh, extreme right wing governments will be so pissed with uh, Angela Merkel that they'll actually leave the EU at which point it will be even worse. And on that happy note, I'll leave uh, this particular nice little visual. On the left you see the 13th century uh, system of global trade, the Afro-Eurasian trading system. 12th century, and on the right you see the uh, on that one world initiative uh, of China. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we know that it's long, but I